Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 ANU Order of Australia Lecture. Now, I would like to start by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands and airwaves we're meeting this evening. Pay my respect to elders past and present. I'm joining you today from the lands of the Ngunnawal Nambri people, the traditional custodians for this part of Australia for nearly 25 millennia. We're also joined this evening by retired General Michael Crane, Director of Order Australia Association. It's nice to have you again with us, Mike, albeit virtually, and I am looking forward to resuming this annual lecture on campus again in a new normal 2022. ANU has had a long standing affiliation with the association, and it's one that I hope to continue in the years to come. The Order of Australia Lecture was established in 2010 as another way to acknowledge members of our community who have been recognized for their distinguished service to the nation. And we've had some incredible speakers over the years, including public policy expert, Professor Andrew Ponger, uh, historian, Professor Anne McGraw, and equity advocate, uh, the late Honorable Susan Ryan. Uh, even I delivered this lecture back in 2013 uh, and actually, uh, unwittingly, I declared my vision for the future of ANU and began baby steps, not realized at the time, of becoming the vice chancellor. I have to admit, it was not on my mind when I gave the lecture in 2013. Tonight, I'm very proud to say that we will hear from Professor Peter Yu, who will speak about his vision for the First Nations portfolio and reflections on his past experiences in navigating his career such a young age, noting the difficulties trying to navigate ongoing tensions of living in a colonized environment, uh, growing up, uh, of course, in uh, Western Australia. I do thank you very much for making time to share uh, your journey with us tonight, Peter. Peter is a Yaru man from the Kimberley region and vice president of the ANU First Nations portfolio, the first person we've had in that portfolio. As Australia's national university, uh, we see it as our responsibility to advance the lives of Indigenous Australians and ensure all Australians have equal opportunity. ANU was founded in 1946, 75 years ago, in a spirit of post-World War II optimism. And part of our founding mission is to, is to support the development of a national unity and identity, to help us understand ourselves and our neighbours, and to provide our nation with a research capacity amongst the best in the world. And as we celebrate that 75th birthday, uh, our unique national mission shines through, especially in Peter's work, which plays a critical role, helping build a more inclusive nation, providing leadership on national policy discourse and decisions that impact the First Nations people of Australia. Reconciliation ultimately is about mutual respect and listening. And we need to ensure our First Nation voices are heard and embed their knowledge, principles, and ways of learning into the teaching that we do so we gain an understanding of each other. We also want to provide a space for articulating a vision uh, for the future with our community, the First Australians, and non-Indigenous Australians alike. The university is very fortunate to have Peter's guidance to ensure ANU is a world leading in teaching and researching areas of interest around First Nations people. And of course, it is about understanding that the path to reconciliation is not just a responsibility of First Nations people. Indeed, it actually lies with non-First Nations people. It underpins all aspects of Australian society. We all have a part to play, and I encourage everyone to stand up. And it is uh, really quite uh, fulfilling, I can say, from a personal journey in this space, and I encourage everyone else to join it. There's so much to learn. Peter's work goes well, at, well beyond ANU. His 40 years experience in indigenous development and advocacy at the state, the national and international level. And in June this year, Peter was made a member of the Order of Australian Recognition for a significant service to indigenous culture and political organization. His work has been instrumental in developing many community-based organizations and initiatives, which have had an enduring influence on the Kimberley region. It is indeed an honor to have Peter deliver tonight's lecture, and I am looking forward to hearing his reflections and vision in a very fitting titled speech, Looking Forward, Looking Back. So Peter, 
Without further ado, I welcome you uh, to the virtual stage to speak, and thank you for coming along tonight. Thank you, uh, Brian, uh, for your generous and warm welcome. Um, but first of all, I'd, I'd like to also acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and to pay my respects to their elders past and present and to all those emerging leaders in our community, be they Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, who have the responsibility to guide us into the future. I do acknowledge our Chancellor, the Honourable Julie Bishop. Um, I also acknowledge you, Brian, as our Vice-Chancellor. Um, can I also acknowledge uh, Barry Martin Ayo, who's the National Chair of the Order of Australia Association, and Michael Crane, the Chair of the ACT Order of Australia Association. I also acknowledge fellow ANU award recipients and all other members of the uh, Australia, Order of Australia Association. I must be honest and say that I had mixed feelings about accepting Brian's invitation to deliver this lecture, this presentation, as I did when I was first notified by the awards office about the offer of the award. Many mixed thoughts instantly flooded my brain as to what I would say. To be honest with you, I did have some misgivings as to the appropriateness of accepting the award. And I don't say this to cast aspersions on Australia's honours. It's a well-respected and regarded means to recognise people's efforts and achievements in their careers and fields of endeavours. Although, as we all know, the Australian honour system has not been without controversy in recent years. The course of question of my own position in weighing up the merits of accepting the award comes from a very personal life and work experience. And it's probably one of the few times that I have actually um, talked about my own self because I'm not somebody who likes to do that. I'd rather talk about what the, what the issues are um, and discuss how we might uh, look at more creative ways of addressing the ongoing uh, matters that we're still remain unresolved in this country. But as an Indigenous man navigating the challenges here in this country, in this very slow and incremental process of unraveling the legacies of colonization and dealing with the contradictions that this process continually throws up on a daily basis to First Nation communities in this country. A comment by a colleague of mine that this award from, is award from the colonizers and invaders resonated with me somewhat. I am by nature a hopeful person and I try to push away the corrosive feeling of cynicism that can be easily lead, that can easily lead to one uh, into powerlessness and passivity. I continue to advocate and work to heal the wounds of colonization and to make Australia an inclusive nation. I chose the title of my delivery from a Slim Dusty song, Looking Forward, Looking Back. Slim Dusty, in my view, made a significant contribution to reconciliation in this country before it was a popular thing. Through his songwriting and performances that brought black and white Australians together through their common connections and love of the country, long before we started talking about reconciliation. The bush life and characters he boat are aptly brought to life in Slim songs for those of us living and coming from the bush. We always felt that he had written those songs just for us, with all of us in mind. He was and still is an iconic figure and enormously popular in First Nation Australia. There is something in his lyrics that connect all Australians, and I think it particularly resonates with those uh, of us who come and who live in the bush, but I also think if uh, others living all around the country took time to listen to it, would, would appreciate the nature of the very intimate sentiments that Slim is able to portray. There's absolutely nothing like driving out in the middle of the bush, accompanied with Slim on the cassette, I'm showing my age now, I suppose, cassette or CD or radio, singing when the rain tumbles down in July. Or one of his multitude of other major hits and songs, with your car window roll down and the sweet smell of spinifex after the first rains. In picking the title of the song for my delivery, Slim sings in his opening lines, looking forward, looking back. I've come a long way down the track, making sense of what I've seen, 
We've got a long way to go. The offer for the award came the day of the 30th anniversary of the handing down of the 1991 Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths and Custody Report. That day was a poignant moment of reflection for all First Nations peoples. A reminder of how little progress has been made despite the recognition of our common law rights and the growing awareness of the truth of our nation's history. The tragic reality is that far more First Nation peoples are incarcerated in Australia today than was in 1991. As someone who worked as Commissioner Patrick Dodson's associate on the Royal Commission, it particularly resonates. Having visited every prison and most of the police lockups throughout Western Australia, while simultaneously running formal hearings and listening to the personal and painful stories of the families whose loved ones were subject to the investigation, talking to them and their affected families was a poignant moment of reflection for me personally. Knowing well, knowing full well that the circumstances and subsequent recommendations of the Commission had failed to shift the bar to any significance to bring relief to this terrible injustice of our people, something that continues unabated today. Before I proceed further, I want to tell you a little, a little bit about myself to bring you into context as to why the consideration of the ward was such a thought provoking consideration and dilemma as I expect it is to too, as to too many other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'm third generation Catholic mission descendant, a Yaru person. My grandmother was a member of the stolen generation, a Bunaba woman taken from her traditional lands in the Fitzroy Valley of the West Kimberley around 1910 and raised at Beagle Bay Mission, where she met my grandfather who was working there. My mother was one of 13 children, and like most of her siblings, were raised in the mission dormitory and largely brought up by the St. John of God nuns. My father was a Chinese pearl diver, having arrived on Australian shores as an indentured labourer in the pearling industry after the Second World War. Under the apartheid laws of the state at that time, my mother and father were not allowed to marry, as it was illegal to cohabit with the native attracting a fine, possible imprisonment, and then deportation. I grew up not knowing the intricacies of the oppressive, oppressive regime that my parents and family experienced. I had a very happy childhood growing up fishing and roaming the beaches of Broome, most of the time until it was my turn to be sent south to the Catholic mission and school at the age of 11. Notwithstanding the thought and excitement of heading off to the big smoke, it was a traumatic and transformative time taking me away from my family and home environment. For those of you who have seen Jimmy Chai's musical play, Brand New Day, but that was later made into a feature film, was also my experience and the experience of many other children like me. Some would say my parents had agreed to the church, to the church's intervention in my, at my young age, an experience shared by countless other Aboriginal kids. But in reality, I had, I had little choice. While I was not stolen in the literal sense that the 1997 Bring Them Home report chronicled, my experience should be seen in the context of that shameful period of Australian history. Along with other kids who were flown to Perth and placed at the Palatine Training Centre, a mission run by the Catholic German Order for young Aboriginal boys and girls. To say I was intimidated, isolated, and traumatised is an understatement. It was such a far cry from growing up in a relatively free, independent and joyful lifestyle in Broome. Palatine was a regimented, physical and psychologically oppressive and sexually abusive environment, something that no child should experience. I raise this to highlight the reality of Australia that I and many other First Nation children grew up in and unfortunately many still continue to grow up in. An experience that has shaped my view of this nation and which has caused me to think about the value of the award when it was offered. To me growing up in this environment in the height of governments and colluding institutions, assimilationist push was like being put in a prison 
that was almost impossible to escape. And I know many people would have said and still say that yes, without that experience, you would not have had a good education and be where you are today. And that's what I've been told all of my life. But what I have learned, as many like as like many of my peers, was to survive. Many of us failed in our scholarly attempts, being preoccupied how to deal with the racism and abuse from our teachers and fellow students alike. It was a daily struggle to not succumb to the mental and other pressures of feeling isolated and alone. As part of the ongoing assimilation and social experience training, we were allocated out to white families every Sunday of the month, to unfamiliar people, culture and values. We decided for all the good intentions, it was like a lottery. Some kids had good experiences, some kids bad. I was one of the fortunate ones to have a positive experience with a very good family. The school we went to, Clontarf, known today for its positive reputation for developing education and sporting prowess with young Aboriginal boys around the country. Clontarf was established by the Christian Brothers as a boys' orphanage back in 1901. For wards of the state and from the late 1940s for child immigrants from Britain and Malta, and an institution exposed for its physical and sexual abuse of young boys, a matter that was subject to the Royal Commission into the institutional responses to child sexual abuse, with compelling evidence from victims of the horrendous crimes committed against them. As children growing up in that environment, we knew and felt something was terribly wrong. The air was always thick of suspicion and innuendo, with an ever-present sense of evilness permeating the environment. We all felt this even in our youthful naivety. The only relief was playing football on the Saturday morning on some suburban footy field. An opportunity to forget where we were, to attack the ball and opposition with hard physical gusto, to relieve all of the week's tensions and to prepare for the following week to do it again. My post-school life was one of great adventure and opportunities, provided to me largely by senior and other cultural leaders in my own communities back in the Kimberleys. Through my experience of this period, I began to explore and understand the history and experience of Aboriginal Australia, and particularly its emotional and other impact on me, my family, and our community. The great Aboriginal leader, Dr. Loa Jo O'Donoghue, said of her own experience, and I quote, I am sometimes identified as one of the success stories of the policies of removal of Aboriginal children. But for much of my childhood, I was deeply unhappy. I feel I've been deprived of love and the ability to love in return. Like Lily, my mother, I felt totally powerless. And I think this is where the seeds of my commitment to human rights and social justice were sown. There was absolutely no doubt about the strong sense of familiarity that I and all Indigenous people have to the sentiment through our shared history and experience and that, and that we continue to find ourselves challenged with daily. The current COVID risk facing First Nation communities is a confronting and continuing illustration of public policy and program failure on multiple fronts. What COVID has done is expose the ongoing health, the housing and other vulnerabilities in our communities. We have always been in crisis in health, in housing, in education, employment, and dealing substantially in closing the gap to the standards most enjoyed by most Australians. Notwithstanding the necessity to work towards this attainment, I think we all know that this will never happen while we continue to be shackled to the dominations of neo-colonial practices under the bureaucratic regime repeatedly and systematically operating in a way that reinforces the past. So what should we do? Does COVID also provide an opportunity? What should we look to, look to inspire to in a post-COVID environment to aspire to? Many commentators and the general public talk about 
returning to normal. An aspiration in my view now passed, just like the fourth industrial revolution changing our lives from anything but normal with the rapid change in new technology. There's also the realization that beyond COVID, we will have to adapt to the new normal. Responding to the continuing threat of the evolution of the virus and emerging variants, requiring us to embed in our daily lives all the necessary protective protocols we have had to learn and endure. At another level, this is a discussion point I would welcome when we contemplate an alternative approach on how a new normal would apply and affect the nation, where we could design a new set of standards and protocols when considering our relationships with First People. Perhaps we could turn to addressing foundational relationship issues like constitutional reform measures, addressing the recognition of Australia's First People, how to formulate, structure, and activate the Makarata Tooth Gully Commission, and steps to formalize a treaty and settling compensation for past justices. Immediately though, and because of the devastating impact the spread of the COVID will have in our communities with potentially high mortality levels and long-term health effects when the pandemic takes a foothold, it should cause us to consider what needs to be done now to manage and mitigate this risk. To do that, we need government commitment and partnership to put together a stimulus economic initiative structured around addressing the current crisis through a national housing and infrastructure investment strategy, committing to this over a sustained period of time to help stimulate the local and regional economies, generating employment and training for local indigenous communities, beginning a relationship, allowing people, Aboriginal people to own the risks themselves. When I first was invited to join the ANU, I had to think about what this university was about and what I could do to contribute to its nation building work. After decades of work in advocacy, negotiation and policy formation, I felt I could bring the experience to a university that in my view has a national responsibility to create and shine a light of important national policy issues focusing on building matters that challenge us as a community and a country to think and question when addressing the question of common good. I became acquainted um, and considered Nugget Coombs a friend who devoted much of his latter life to advance the rights of Indigenous peoples. He taught me a lot and he taught me about this great university, the ANU. To interrogate, to explore, to research, to create a space and environment for asking the hard questions, and then to build a partnership and pathways to reform and change what's not working for the common good. The ANU strategic plan is identified by its purpose statement and its vision, and it states, to serve society through transformative research and education, and our vision will be that the ANU will be among the great universities of the world and driven by a culture of excellence in everything we do. The ANU's 2025 strategic plan is underpinned by the ANU's values of academic freedom and integrity, fairness and justice, respecting, celebrating and learning from First Nations peoples, safety and well-being, truth-seeking, transparency and accountability, inclusion, equity, and diversity, and respectful collegiality. This is, of course, is further underpinned by key strategic priorities. In establishing the First Nations portfolio, I needed to consider how within the framework and objectives of the ANU 2025, we could design a complementary First Nation portfolio plan. We required this, but this hasn't yet been completed, but we have commenced through our initial business case the genesis of such a plan. This is predicated on addressing both ends of what I see are the important of the spectrum. First, to consider at one end, addressing policy reform measures around unresolved historical legacies and tensions between the First Peoples and the Australian, Australian nation state. Like the issues I've mentioned, like representation, about truth telling, isn't it interesting that the news the other day that the 
uh, Norwegians, Scandinavian countries are setting up the uh, Truth Telling Commission dealing with their First Nation peoples, the Sami. Compensation and agreement making. And secondly, in partnership with local communities, designing and scoping research and projects to deliver serious capacities for communities to own their own risks, largely to facilitate governance and management capability through data sovereignty and management capacity in addressing their own aspirations in a post-native title, determination and post-land rights era, activating their sizable asset base and gaining a foothold in the local and regional economies. In between both spectrums is the responsibilities of deconstructing the colonial aspects of education through teaching, curriculum, student well-being, and academic achievement and professional development and employment. While ambitious, it's only the beginning. We won't be able to achieve this without the internal ANU and external support and collaboration or partnership with government, philanthropy, the private sector, and importantly, the communities we engage with. At the end of all of this, I decided to accept the award for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to pay respect and acknowledge the senior cultural leaders who had given me the opportunity to serve under them and for them and all of the opportunities that I have had. I was fortunate to have served my apprenticeship under their guidance and trusted to advocate their aspirations and expectations. Without them, I would not have had the opportunities that I have had and the award is dedicated to their struggle. I also wanted to pay acknowledgement to my family for their patience, for their support and their perseverance, because it is an unusual life with many practices, practices sac sacrifices, sorry, that you have to make up to live and work in this space. Secondly, in football parlance, you can't kick goals if you're not on the oval and in the game. In closing, can I further acknowledge the Chancellor and the Vice-Chancellor, my colleagues on the Executive and the Senior Managing Group. I'm excited to have joined the team. Everyone has embraced the notion of the First Nation portfolio and it made me and my team feel welcome. And I look forward to further developing our working relationships. Galia, and thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. My name's Michael Crane and I'm the chair of the ACT branch of the Order of Australia Association and I'll be chairing the question and answer uh, session that Peter's generously agreed uh, to participate in. Can I begin though by uh, adding my own acknowledgement to the original custodians of the land on which we all meet right across Australia. Uh, in, in this year's particular case, Peter, uh, we have members from all around Australia uh, of the Order of Australia Association. Uh, well over 100 have joined us for the session tonight. So very excited to, um, to have you here with us. Um, I guess perhaps I might reserve the, the, the chair's right to ask the first question. Um, you're a member of numerous reference groups and committees uh, around the country. Um, the you're chair of the Indigenous Reference Group to the Northern Ministerial Forum, Deputy Chair of Nailsma and, and so on, uh, half a dozen. It's um, difficult to understand how you actually find the time to be at the university with all of those commitments. Would you like to say a little bit about uh, that work and, and, and how uh, that all sort of uh, progresses the, your objectives? Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, I mean, it's a very good question and timely one because uh, unfortunately I've had to uh, step down from a couple of those that you've mentioned, mainly because the uh, demands, my, my obvious uh, first responsibility to the university, but notwithstanding that, uh, it doesn't mean that I won't have ongoing uh, involvement and participation. I'm, I'm extremely passionate about Northern Australia uh, and about the opportunities that are presented um, in terms of the abilities. I, I mentioned in my delivery the post native title determination and, and land rights era. And the, 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 the detail of that is that Aboriginal people have a direct uh, and indirect interest in the in the physical assets, land assets of the, of the nation to the extent of about 51% uh, overall. But in the North, it's something like about uh, 85, 90%. Um, 
So uh, when we talk about developing North Australia, um, it, it, it would seem um, unthinkable that you wouldn't contemplate the nature of the, um, the position of equity that Aboriginal people can bring. And the value that that brings in terms of the activation of those assets um, and uh, for the local and regional economies. Um, I think, but, but, I, but I also think we, we are challenged by the ongoing systemic nature of the way that um, the, the, the codependency relationship, if you like, between governments and Aboriginal people uh, and the way that unfortunately, the way the Federation operates, the very convoluted and very confusing uh, way in being able to design particular programs and the delivery of those programs in a more efficient and productive manner that actually delivers the benefit. I, I think that that's a key challenge. But um, uh, there's, I've, I've also just joined the Water Trust Board. I'm sure they won't uh, mind me saying that, but uh, I think that's a critically uh, important initiative in terms of where water, of course, important for the nation, that's a particular kind of importance for Aboriginal people um, and uh, Aboriginal people have less than 1% interest uh, in water um, right now at the moment from the point of view of licenses or trading or being involved in the industry and the economy. So um, we have a long way to go to make up. Terrific, thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from participants, uh, but I would just encourage those who are listening in uh, from around the country to to send questions in and the moderator will send them through to me and then I can pass them on uh, to you, Peter. Let me begin uh, with one that we've got from, um, from Pam in Melbourne, uh, who says that we've been well served by many of our governor generals, but uh, she wonders whether as part of your vision, you can see a day when we might move beyond um, military male governors general to having our own first Indigenous woman as the Governor-General, as was recently done in New Zealand? I think the day is coming. I think that, you know, today, obviously, um, uh, I think, as I say, I'm a positive half glass full person. Um, I think, you know, we've seen, uh, so, so, so Doug Nichols was the first um, Governor of, West, of South Australia, sorry, um, many, many years ago. Um, he's an iconic Australian figure, I think, We've also seen um, the, the the latest uh, governor in um, in South Australia. I think um, I, I apologise, I've forgotten his name, but obviously was a um, um, a refugee from um, from Vietnam. Uh, that's that's quite a, a dramatic change. I think I think we will do, um, but largely, of course, um, without wanting to you know get involved in the in the politics of it all. Um, I think there is this perhaps. Uh, there, there is a, a, a time coming soon that should happen. I think a lot of people, that's not in any way casting any dispersions on the particular uh, people who occupy the positions coming from military backgrounds. I think they've all been wonderful representatives in that position. So it's not a, not, it's not a personal thing, but it is more what is right for a maturing, modern, developing social democracy in terms of how is that diversity represented. Um, and I think that that's what um, you know the, the the growing sense of need and purpose is in relation to equity and diversity. And I think it's uh, we speak it very well, but I don't think we actually measurably live up to that very much. Okay, thanks. Perhaps from that uh, quite hopeful uh, and positive sort of outlook to something that's a bit a bit of a curlier question, uh, one from. Uh, from Richard, who asks, what specific policy and action can address the chronic lack of hope and opportunity for First Nation peoples in remote rural communities? For example, uh, and I hope I've got this right, Warrena in Western New South Wales, uh, where there's a, a, a male life expectancy of just 43 years. Well, I, I, part of our, my delivery is also about owning risk. I, I talked about the codependency relationship between government. I, Unless you're actually working in the space, you don't appreciate the intensity of the um, the bureaucracy in its domination of um, the way in which government business operates. Um, I think an example would be, for instance, uh, talking about Barwarana um, and and um, and the other towns out there, just kind of finding their way through the COVID crisis. 
Uh, many of those people wrote to the government uh, in, in, in early 2020, expressing their concern and seeking to want to work with the government in putting in place a plan to deal with the threat of the spread of the pandemic. Um, that was not responded to, unfortunately. The views of the Aboriginal community, for people wanting to take up the responsibility to protect their own community, um, and, and hence what we had was an outbreak, and what we have is a higher infection rate uh, in those vulnerable communities. So I think what is what is really required is is very much structural reforms um, in terms of that relationship between governments. You've got a the system you've got to I guess appreciate is you're dealing with Commonwealth, you're dealing with state, and you're dealing with local government. I think it's not untrue to say we're all quite familiar with the, the, the level of red tape and bureaucracy that confronts us on a daily basis. And, and But if you're an Aboriginal person coming from a zero, zero kind of a base in regards to um, having any decent income, having a house, um, having a job, um, the dependency relationship is so dramatically different. And that's why I think I, I also suggested that what we should look at, take advantage of the post-COVID um, recovery environment, there should be a very strategic uh, development, growth and investment strategy that actually looks at building housing and other associated infrastructure around the health and environmental matters that enable greater level of governance uh, and management capacity uh, where people can actually do the things themselves. And the problem is that a lot of Aboriginal people um, have not been able to fail at things, uh, if you like, even though we can constantly get the blame for, for failing everything. But, you know, I was saying this afternoon that a, a friend of mine, I've said it before, so I'm, I'm sure this who, who might be on will... will, will We'll, uh, we'll have heard me say this before, but a very good friend of mine, Gallery Yunapingu, said to me, you know, 20 years ago, he said, um, when the government tells you there's a light at the end of the tunnel, he said, don't believe them. And I said, well, I said, why is that? And, I, I, <laughs> and he said, because it's a bureaucrat with a torch running backwards. That's the experience of many Aboriginal people. I, I don't mean any disrespect to, uh, to any people working in the bureaucracy, but unfortunately, that's the reality. Okay, can I just follow up on that and, and ask whether you think uh, in your experience over 20 years and more, uh, has that improved at all? Has the experience improved at all from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspective? Or is it, in, I'm reflecting, uh, for example, on the national institutions here in Canberra, and sometimes it just seems that all that's happening is we have a change of name, maybe a slight change of focus and uh, not much else changes. Look, uh, there's some irony in, in my answer in, in, to the extent that, yes, um, there was a period there back in the 90s with the creation of uh, ATSIC where there was a, a large push to employ Aboriginal people within the bureaucracy. Uh, and of course, uh, ATSIC was, a, was a, an unusual kind of uh, beast in, it, in, in, its, in that era, given that it had elected members at the regional level and at the national level, and it was able to engage with government on policy. Unfortunately, it couldn't be sustained through some unfortunate acts, but it, your point is right. From that point onwards, we've seen a decline of senior Aboriginal bureaucrats at the head of these various departments. Um, there's certainly a, a, an attempt to reinvigorate that, uh, but I think that governments have... Um, um, the danger and risk is, is that there's a... a a risk of appropriating the nature of what it is that Aboriginal people see as being important to them and, and building it in the bureaucracy and, and kind of um, uh, manufacturing and adjusting it to the needs of the government program rather that it, it loses its strength and its, and its principal position in regards to Aboriginal people having control when it gets under there. And I, I think at the moment we're in a, my own personal views, I think we're in a fairly terrible position in relation to um, uh, the kind of federal organisations that are there uh, to um, work with the Aboriginal community. Um, 
from a government policy position. The only government policy that the, the, the obviously the flagship policy is closing the gap. And while obviously there are merits in wanting to work in that area, you have to ask yourself the question, why are we doing this? I mean, this has been like 50 years of a significant public investment and we're still basically at ground zero um, with a lot of these communities in terms of their health and their housing and their other, um, other, other essential material needs and requirements. So, you know, we have to ask ourselves this question and the, well, why do we keep on doing the same things and, and, and seeing the same kind of failure levels? Why, why, you know, that's an important issue of accountability for governments in my, in my view. Okay, thank you. Uh, something uh, a little closer to home, uh, uh, an anonymous question uh, which, which asks, I'm just an ordinary member of the Australian National University. What can I do to respectfully offer support? Well, um, it's, a, it's a good question. And a lot of people ask that question. Um, and uh, not just, I mean, I've, I've always, there's a lot of good people in this country. I, I, I think that's given and they do want to do the right thing, but uh, and they don't know how to do that. So certainly we as a portfolio have a responsibility um, to be able to reach out to those uh, people at the university in a more uh, coherent way. Uh, we're only a fledging organization, but we'll do that. The, the intent of the university is to ensure that we do have that ability to provide uh, options um, for individuals and others, academic and professional staff and others to, to work with us. I think basically um, the, the first responsibility is to really inquire. I mean, the university is an education institution. The first thing is to inquire, is to delve, to see it as a portal uh, to, to understand better because I think, you know, I think that we, as Australians, we, we, we remain diminished if we don't make an attempt, we don't do our work to find out what the truth, what the reality of the situation is. Um, there are many competing views, but um, I think the way, best way is to really, you know, I'm happy to reach out for that particular person who would like to communicate with me offline at some time. I'm happy to talk about what some of the things we might be able to do. But gen generally speaking, I think, um, you know, it's important to acquire. That's what, and that's what the university is there for. Sure. Thank you. Uh, the, the next one is another anonymous one, uh, which says that the Makarata Commission doesn't get much attention as part of the Uluru Statement. What does truth telling look like? Is it something we can start on while we wait for constitutional reform and or agreement uh, making, which seems more politically charged? I think it's a really great question, uh, Michael. I think I think there are things we can start on. Um, I think one of the one of the um, there there needs to be a truth telling commission because I mean you know uh, we can't move on unless there is a clear line of the sand drawn. You know, warts and all. I think we're we're obliged as a country to do that. Um, I think we can start to do things. Um, I and Brian will know. I've said on a number of occasions. What we really need in this country is a national oral history project. What we really need is a way of reaching out um, so that we can get black and white people to tell their stories at the local level. It should be a national program. Um, if the government you know, can spend uh, $500 million on the War Memorial, I think that it can spend you know, uh, half that amount of money in terms of setting up a national oral history project that would uh, be operated at the local level bring um, local people together to in telling their stories, to document those stories. I think we need to have a, uh, a National Oral History Centre uh, at the university so that we're able to, um, uh, to house those stories. But it's, there's, there's many different aspects to that. Part of it is, is obviously very specifically the question of First Nation people's relationship with the nation state. But we're a country also of immigrants. There's a whole history of migration in this country. And I think there's a, a, an added requirement to hear the stories of the people who migrated the country, even if you want to go right back uh, to the first day of, um, of, um, of Philip Lanning in, in, in Sydney Harbour. 
to, to hear the, the real stories so that we shine this beacon of light of, of who we are and what we are, because I don't think we've yet achieved that. We, we struggle with it. We get caught up in the politics. Two thirds of the majority of the population live on the East Coast. Two thirds of the nation is considered rural and remote. Most of us don't look, not well, I not, a lot of people don't look over their backyards to see what's happening in Australia, uh, unless they're off on, on, a, on a trek on some holiday. So I think we can start ourselves. We can start, we shouldn't, and we shouldn't wait for governments to do it. I mean, governments are a necessary partner, obviously. But, you know, there can be um, a significant effort and endeavour made by us in the community. And a project like a National Oral History Project, I think, will stand us in good stead in relation to, uh, because it's at the local level, it's at the personal level, I think it would offer great value. Okay. Uh, the next one is from Gary Humphreys, who's one of our members here in the ACT. He says, Peter, uh, thanks for an excellent and insightful address. Do you feel that the High Court's decisions in Mabo and Wick have satisfactorily resolved the question of restoring Indigenous people's relationship with their traditional lands? Or should political actions now supplement those decisions? Uh, no, because we don't have a uniform system in the country other than the Native Title Act, which operates um, obviously as a consequence of the Mabo decision in 92. Um, but uh, Western Australia still doesn't have a, a, a piece of legislation that um, um, you know, puts in play a kind of administration and management of those interests. So it's left to the, uh, again, to the courts, um, even though I must say that there have been some successful negotiations through consent determinations outside of the, uh, the litigious environment. But um, I think um, the land is the one part of the issue. And it's a very convoluted and confused. It takes a lot of money. Most native title bodies, they call prescribed body corporates, probably only get about fifty-eight, sixty thousand dollars a year. That's not enough to employ somebody to work to take advantage of the nature of the opportunity that is gained from the recognition of their, their native title rights. But out of that is missing the whole question of water. Water is a central part um, to the cultural and ritual needs and imperatives that drive. Uh, Aboriginal traditional life and customary life. Um, we all, it's just common sense. I mean, we all know we're a drought country, we're a fire country. Um, water uh, is a critical part for every critical part of the whole makeup for every one of us. But it has a very peculiar and very particular um, meaning and responsibility in uh, Aboriginal cultural terms. And that's not something that's contained within the, um, the Marva High Court decision. Um, I think the whole question of uh, representation, uh, the question of compensation, I mean, basically native title is really a matter of recognition of, of rights. It's not a, a separate tenure as such. Uh, it, 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 the, the, the High Court decision in, in uh, Timber Creek in, in 2017 provides some level of uh, insight into the valuation of native title uh, of rights or interest, sorry, tenure as opposed to fee simple. But what it doesn't do, and that's going to be a major issue, Michael, that because that hasn't yet been addressed by governments, but it's a, it's a live issue at the moment where governments are going to have to address the question of compensation following the Timber Creek decision in 2017. So Mabo is just a step. One comment I would like to make, which is kind of a good surgery into it, the, the question is, is we have lurched from crisis to crisis and milestone from milestone. What I mean by that is since 1967 uh, to the partial award wages in 68 and 72, since the first uh, Aboriginal uh, department in 1976, the Land Rights Act in 1975. Um, if you look at the history, this, this notion of incrementalism in achievement of certain socio-cultural and legal milestones is something that cruels us because the fundamental thing is that Aboriginal people are not involved in the planning and the termination and then in the execution of those achievements. And for many of these um, achievements, it has taken significant number of years of litigation on behalf of Aboriginal people to attain 
just recognition. The question is, what is right? What is morally right? What is legally right in terms of government's leadership? What is right for this country? Because it's not just a matter of what's right for First Nations people. It is what is right for the country. How do we demonstrably reconcile the difference to the extent that the well-being and health of the nation and well-being and the common good for the nation is something that becomes a critical part of our nation building agenda. That, that is to me the question. And I think this is where, unfortunately, we've had consecutive, doesn't matter which color political party, we've had constant failure, constant failure to deal with this in a mature and a responsible manner uh, for the good of the nation. Mm. Um, <laughs> the uh, thank you. The next one is from Phil. There's there's a number of questions rolling in now, and I hope we're going to be able to do justice to them in the time that's remaining. Uh, the next one from Phil again here in Canberra. Uh, he says, in the context of an Australia of 2021, where many of our citizens uh, are of more recent overseas heritage, not related to the colonial era, and and thus they may not understand some of that background that you've talked about. Um, how can we develop a national consensus uh, with that kind of population mix now that's needed to address your uh, aspirations for us as a nation to redress the wrongs? Well, um, unfortunately, like everything in Australia, you know, as, as much as I might sound critical of government, we need government. Um, and we need the leadership of government. And that's really what I despair at, um, quite frankly. Um, and I guess the, where governments have a role with, um, with people who've just recently come to the country, um, or they might be young, and I think obviously there is a grave risk of, of losing the kind of intellectual knowledge uh, of the history of Australia if um, we don't deal with this in an organised manner. But I think this is where governments have a responsibility in, in, in again, for the common good of being able to bring into uh, play support in partnership with Aboriginal people, the kind of value and benefits of um, the um, inclusive, inclusivity of or including Ab Aboriginal people in the national landscape, um, political and legal and social landscape. Um, you know, it, it just astounds me that we, as the oldest living continuous country culture on earth, uh, should, should have to strive to Get that acknowledgement from our government to acknowledge what the kind of um, what the importance of that recognition and the values that we bring to that, not just in a general principle sense, but I mean, talk today about climate change. They just finished the Glasgow uh, COP conference. Aboriginal people are now involved in uh, large scale uh, carbon offset programs um, by using their traditional fire management techniques by looking at things of biodiversity management, uh, by looking at questions of adding value to, uh, to the trading environment in relation to the, the co-benefits that come from getting jobs and training people. Um, the, the, I think there's a, there's a different way we have to actually um, couch the kind of narrative and the message. Things have changed dramatically, and, but I think uh, with it, we have to be uh, much more creative uh, about talking about the values and about the importance of the contribution that uh, First Nations peoples bring um, for the benefit of the country. You know, in some ways, while people recognise the custodianship of traditional owners of their country, in some ways, uh, much of the skills and the knowledge that, that Aboriginal people bring are custodians for the national the state. It's for all Australians, not just in terms of the imperatives that drive the cultural and customary responsibilities, but it's also about um, we all are, are awakening to the dangers and threat of climate change and the risk there is. Um, and we've had demonstrated issues with the wildfires and storms and flooding and all that sort of stuff. The, the question is, um, how can we learn from the knowledge of um, millennia uh, and longer, uh, the knowledge base that Aboriginal people have to contribute to um, being able to future-proof the country. Um, you know, we could use the narrative around very positive, uplifting kind of things, rather than, and the media's got to be able to come to this as well. 
unfortunately we largely the the kind of the nature of the unfortunate relationship we have with the with the continuing um systemic racism that we see in this country is largely um, reinforced by the way the media operates and i think that they can play a dramatic role in um, in shifting the mindset uh, of of ordinary Australians. Okay, uh, several more coming in, but I think we probably just had time for one last one. Uh, this is from uh, from Bruce, who asks, or he says, "Thank you, Peter, for the courage you showed in revealing those deeply troubling stories from your youth. It strikes me that the institution where you were placed must be a haunted place." a site of trauma for Indigenous Australians and others across the generations. How can such sites be healed? Have there, have there been ceremonies that try to resolve and move beyond the pain that was suffered there? Um, it's, it's, it's a good question. I, I, I've never returned there. Others, I know my other peers, some of them have returned and visited to try and deal with those ghosts. Um, I know uh, it's certainly not there as a, a mission anymore. It's been converted into a retirement village for um, for the Catholic Church, um, and so um, or, or sold off for a housing development. So I I I think it's interesting because uh, after I left the institution um, in my very early days, I tried to um, speak to my peers about group counselling. I was uh, fairly traumatized by it, and I, I, I wanted to, to, unfortunately, many had died. Um, there were very talented people. Many of them are my relations, my cousins and my uncles and others who were very successful, in, in, particularly in, in doing apprenticeships, um, you know, in, in, as carpenters, as mechanics. But when they left the mission and they went back home, they 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 just fell apart because they because they 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 had been away from their culture from their family they didn't know where they fitted in to their community so many of them um, took up various vices that obviously were detrimental to their health um, and so uh, then but unfortunately I didn't get a response from anybody I I thought it would be a good start for us ourselves to to talk about it. Um, to find out each other's experience, but that didn't happen. Um, and I think that's the problem. We also grew up in the era, like a lot of other Australians, where we weren't allowed to talk about those issues. Mental health issues were not seen as you weren't a man or you, you, you had to, you know, you, you were weak somehow if you were able to express a, a, an emotional point of view on things. And that also affected many Aboriginal people. It was very confusing um, that, um, you're completely taken out of your cultural life, your family life, your uh, into it's like another country. It's a foreign country. You, you don't know. You can't speak. Initially, we weren't. We couldn't speak the language. We weren't allowed to speak our language. We weren't allowed to mix with other Aboriginal people. Uh, we weren't allowed to. Uh, we were. We were regimented uh, in everywhere we went. Um, so uh, you know. That's a, the, the truth telling, you know, commission, the Macarata Commission is the process that will help to heal that. The, the, the unfortunate thing, you know, is we haven't gone anywhere near resolving the stolen generation issues, notwithstanding the government's recent announcement to provide some level of payment to stolen generation people in the ter Northern Territory and the ACT. Which equates to only about seventy thousand dollars, I think, per person. But you know, um, um, but it, it hasn't been. We have the apology, um, while symbolically important. What did it offer in real reparation? What did it offer in real sense of improving people's lives? Nothing. Uh, well, that's uh, a very poignant note on which to end. But end we must. Uh, I'm afraid, uh, and I apologise to those whose questions we haven't been able to get to, but our time is up. Uh, Peter, can I uh, just thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for what has been a very worthy addition uh, to the list of ANU lectures. Uh, I've been to half a dozen or so now. I, I missed the first 
half dozen, including Brian, but uh, I, I think in terms of uh, being both uplifting but profoundly challenging at the same time, this is certainly uh, the, the best that I've attended. So thank you very much. Thanks for your personal insights in particular. And uh, as somebody has said, the courage in sharing those with us, uh, it's difficult to understand how, um, how challenging that must have been for you. So thank you very much uh, on behalf of the association for your contribution tonight. Uh, and I guess now, uh, were we face to face, there'd be a round of applause. applause uh, and you can probably hear that echoing uh, through the, the ionosphere around Australia. Uh, let me take the opportunity though, if I may, also to, uh, to thank the Vice-Chancellor, Brian Schmidt, uh, and the University for uh, the continuing support in taking this lecture forward. I know that uh, Brian shared with us um, his own experience from 2013 uh, and the impact that it had on him. Uh, he's told me that story before and I often tell it to people. Uh, so it just goes to underscore the importance uh, of this event. And I think the, um, the attendance that we've had tonight also demonstrates that, as I said uh, earlier, it's a, it's a record attendance. So thank you, Peter, for that, but also thank you to the university for your continuing support. Uh, thanks in particular to uh, Jerry Neal, uh, Rebecca and all the rest of the ANU staff who uh, sat behind the scenes and made this all possible. Um, you know, you all know who you are, uh, and I really value the relationship that we have with you um, in bringing this together every year. Uh, can I also thank, of course, all those who did register from around the country, including our Order of Australia Association uh, members, particularly those who asked questions. Uh, I trust you enjoyed it, uh, and. We very much look forward to trying to meet together face to face uh, next year for the first time in a couple of years. But uh, Brian, perhaps in the back of our minds, we might uh, also note that there's a considerable advantage in broadcasting live around the country so that we can share experiences like this very rich experience tonight uh, with a much wider audience. Thank you, everybody, and good night.